What are your concerns? Well, not exactly concerns, just I'm interested to hear a little bit more from you because you did an interview with uh, Kontea Prabhu. Oh, Kontea, he was quite... Uh... He was a little provocative. It was a little provocative. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, my goal is to present what I'm calling a devotional account of what took place. So I don't want to try to do like an academic style history. I want everything to be accurate, but I want to focus especially... I would say, I would say there's a balance because it doesn't have to be academic, but at the same time, uh, not academic, but has to be intelligent. Things have to be seen within their historical context. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Things should be in... My, my goal is to interpret... Let me put it this way, interpret the history through the lens of bhakti yoga and, and, and Srila Prabhupada's mood and the mood of our acharyas to be able yeah, to... Yeah, I, I think, yeah, so I think, um, like just to state it very briefly, uh, when Prabhupada left this world, he didn't leave any special or specific instructions for how to be a guru yeah and 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 what made that difficult here's the problem Prabhupada actually held two positions but in his talking about the guru like the guru should do this or the guru should be treated in that way he didn't differentiate often he often did between these two positions and so the two positions Prabhupada held were number one of course he was our diksha guru but number two he was the founder of Acharya. Hmm. But there was no manual. There was no clear explanation like, okay, I'm worshipped in this way because I'm the founder of Acharya, or I do this because I'm, a, I'm, your, I'm your guru. There weren't instructions like that. It was just one thing, undifferentiated. Yeah. And so, I mean, clearly we, I mean, at least I think I understood that. I'm not I mean, I never thought for a moment I'm on Prabhupada's level. I mean, it's obvious to me I'm not. I mean, it still is. And yet, as far as like, okay, should a bona fide guru uh, be worshipped every day? Or, or actually, Guru Puja, I, I prefer to translate the word Puja as honored because the word worship, it sounds like you think you're God in the West. So it's really just honored. Also, the word Puja means honor. Yeah, yeah. So, so do you honor the guru? Is there a, you know, do you do the guru puja? Yes or no? If yes, do you do it in the temple? Do you do it outside the temple? Do you do it every day? Do you do it on his birthday? These are all details. Yeah, yeah. And so there's some really, I don't know. I, I mean, frankly, it's not that everyone in the Hare Krishna movement is really bright about these things. Sure. It's a very there's subtle a topic. Well, it's a settled topic and there's a lot of gross thinking about it. So the point is that I always joke that, you know, Radhana Swami wrote that book, The Journey Home. Yeah. And I always joke, I never could have written the, that book because I had zero interest in Indian gurus. Hmm. Like really zero, none. I, you know, me, Prabhupada is everything. I, you know, I was looking for someone that's going to show me God, take me to God, that's Prabhupada. I had no interest besides that in gurus yeah. or any of this stuff. And so, therefore, it's like, in other words, when Prabhupada left, there had never been in the history of ISKCON a bona fide guru mm -hmm. who was not the founder of Acharya. Yeah. There was not one single example of that. Yeah. And so then you say, well, obviously you should have done this, but not done that. Well, why obvious? Yeah, it wasn't so obvious. Yeah, and then Prabhupada's instruction that don't change anything, just do everything the way I'm doing it. So what does that mean in this case? Yeah. And then and then the fact that practically from day one, we were being attacked by the Gaudiya Moth. They were trying to steal ISKCON devotees, if not just steal ISKCON. And their main argument was, we have old senior gurus. You just have these young gurus. So if, he, so if we, if we would have come out and said, yeah, you know, who are we? We're just a bunch of schmoes. You know, I mean, we're not. Then that would have played right into the hands of the people who are trying yeah. to destroy his gun. 
Yeah. And so it was a very complex situation. There was no, uh, there was no rule book. There was no, you know, user manual. It was the first time in the history of ISKCON that someone was a guru, but not the Acharya, the founder of Acharya. And so there was trial and error. Mm. And um, another reason, just to, you know, just to save a lot of time. I mean, to me as a historian, this is not a big deal to figure out. Another point is that um, if you look at the standard sociology of religion, especially the sociology of religion that talks, you see, sometimes some academic things are really needed so, so we don't say stupid things. No, for sure. Yeah, I appreciate I appreciate that. I, I didn't mean to dismiss the academic view. I just meant um, I want to I want it to be a, a useful resource for Vaishnavas. Yeah, of course, of course. And, 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 and some some reference to scholarship is good. It does, I, I agree. I mean, it's not an academic paper, but in the sociology of religion, it's well understood, universally understood that um, in the first generation of a new relig religious movement, almost always you have what is called a charismatic leader. Mm. Charismatic in this academic sense doesn't mean Elvis Presley. Charismatic yeah. means uh, in the old Greek sense, charisma. Yeah. It means uh, something like what we say, Shakti Aves, that- Yeah, Shakti. Someone, yeah, someone impresses their followers that they have, that this leader has a special connection with God or the highest truth, and therefore what they say is the highest authority. Hmm. And so Prabhupada in that sense, in the academic sense, was a charismatic leader. So um, at that first stage, you don't really have an institution. You just have a leader and followers like Jesus and his apostles and other leaders, they just followed him around. Yeah. And it's the same with Buddha. So then when inevitably the leader passes on, and then you go into the second stage where the charismatic leader, who's the glue that held, held everything together, that gave everyone faith, that person's not there. So how do you compensate for that? How do you keep the leader present? And so what all the science shows is that a movement in order to survive the, uh, the passing of that charismatic leader, it has to take that perceived authority and somehow channel it into a sustainable institutional structure. Hmm. In other words, it's just like uh, Francis of Assisi. He would just travel around naked and sleep out in the cold, which actually, because I, he died at a, not, at a fairly young age because of that. But anyway, so he had followers, and his followers said, uh, we don't think so. We want a building to sleep in. Yeah. So Francis didn't want that. So they had to very politely kind of remove him from his own institution and then, uh, you know, build actually build monasteries because, yeah. because the only way the Franciscan order survived is because people stopped sleeping naked outdoors. And so, yeah. so therefore ISKCON formed and you know, it already had Prabhupada already created an institutional structure. So we had a head start. And then- um, Now the guru position had to be assimilated yeah. into that structure. Formalized. And there are some people who I think are really kind of mindless about that. In fact, I have to answer one of their essays now that say that, oh, there's be no regulation. Anyone wants to be a, become a guru, no rules, which probably would destroy this con within about four months. But anyway, so, so when, but the point is that Prabhupada, who, I don't think he studied the sociology of religion, but you know, he would always just say, well, just do what I'm doing. Just follow me. He's the Acharya. Yeah. <clears throat> and, so, and so Prabhupada, again, combining those, because Prabhupada, and this is typical of the first generation of a new movement, he kind of did everything. He, you know, he told you how to, what, you know, what to take if you had a cold. He told you how to sign a contract. He told you what God is. You know, so, so it was just like Prabhupada was just the authority for everything. Yeah. So therefore, he kind of is like a father wants the children to go into the family business. So Prabhupada encouraged us to, to do like him. He said, you know, he, he one time wrote me a letter and said, in the morning, I give the class and in the afternoon I go to the bank. So 
because I'd written him and said, well, now that I took sannyas, you know, just preach. And he said, no, preach. You like yeah, yeah, yeah. So therefore, when Prabhupada chose new gurus, 11 people, what's very remarkable from, I think, from a, just from a scholarly point of view, or just from anyone's, for anyone, is that he didn't choose one person who was just a saintly Brahmana. Yeah. The only people he chose, the only people he chose were devotees who also were big managers. Yeah. Which is very unusual because it's, you know, it's not that he chose, see, in other words, he chose people that he thought would just go into the family business. Yeah. And, you know, do what I'm doing. The problem is that when you start to get into the second generation of a new religious movement, you need a division of authority. The same, if the same person is the holy leader, but also the manager, it causes trouble. Mm. And because and Krishna himself has divided these two functions. Yeah. They're Brahmanas and Kshatriyas. And so in the but in the first generation of a new religious movement, these two varnas, which Krishna has divided, are kind of brought together. Yeah. But they have to be separated again. And so so that's why I think so many gurus fell down. For one reason is because most of the people that were chosen as gurus were not philosophers or like super brahminical. They were just sort of leaders that managed and yeah. paid the bills and, you know, and somehow had followers and, and also of course gave classes, but it's like, uh, you just go down the list, like say someone like Jaya Tirtha. I mean, he wasn't a philosopher. He wasn't, he wasn't known for giving great classes, but he's a good manager. Yeah. So he became a guru, or um, you know, in other people like that. So, so therefore, because a lot of these people were more managers than philosophers, they were passionate. Yeah. And therefore, when they had this position of guru, their nature, you know, because yeah. managers aren't renounced most of the time. Yeah. And so therefore, when they got into that position, their passionate nature overcame them and there were a lot of fall downs. So, you know, not to speak of the fact that, you know, everyone was still young. So again, if you analyze it in a more rational, historical way, and not just these like, I don't know, these sort of like internet rants, you know, like social yeah. media, these gurus, just, it's not helpful. It doesn't, from a scholarly point of view, it's just all it's it's revealing more about the ranter. Yeah. Than it, uh, Their own. You know, yeah. Okay. Let's do a no nonsense and so on. Yeah. yeah. No nonsense historical analysis. What actually happened? Yeah. For one thing, so it doesn't happen again in the future, and just exactly. Yeah. So that's how I approach. I don't approach it from a, you know, partisan view. This shows the gurus are this, or shows the gurus are that. To me, I just want to understand it rationally what happened why did it happen how can we prevent it happening again so Great. one second get some water sure 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 Of course, nowadays, anyone who has access to the internet is, is a great scholar and philosopher, yeah. <laughs> historian. Yeah, it's one of the downsides. So I, I did have a few questions to clarify what, what happened in those initial years after Srila Prabhupada departed. I'm, I'm interested to hear also from you about more recent history, because my, my goal is to try to write something about the whole progression from 1977 to how we got to where we are today in terms of the ISKCON movement and, and in different parts of the world, how it evolved. Or devolved. Or devolved, yeah, exactly, the, depending on I, the I case. Think, I think basically it's a combination. I mean, a lot of decisions were made just because it was practical mm -hmm. or seemed to be practical at the time. And obviously the quality of leadership in different parts of the world was different. Some places there were very good leaders in other places so so in other in other places really mediocre leadership yeah so i think I, I don't think there's one little like algebraic equation that explains what happened all around the world and that's been one of the big defects in you know some people's attempt to analyze this gun 
and that is they analyze it in some monolithic way as if it was just everyone was the same and people were very different. Yeah. You know, there are different theories of history among historians. One is called the, you know, the, the great leader theory of history. Yeah. Which is that, you know, powerful people change history. Other people, you know, have a Marxist thing, it's all the economy or something. But sure. but I mean, but there's no question there are times and places where one person arises who, like say a Napoleon. Yeah. I don't think any Jean Jacques or or Michel, you know, could have done what Napoleon did. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so the it's it's not that well because of the economic and social sure, situation. Sure, 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 sure. Therefore, no. I mean, there was a Napoleon, and he did do all the good and crazy things that he did, and so yeah. Or 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 there was a Hitler, and so or there was a you know a Gandhi. So it's. You know, things were different in different places. Yeah. Devotees, different, for example, in the West, say in America or Canada, people tend to be more skeptical. In mm -hmm. other parts of the world, they were more believing. You yeah. know, more, they were sort of had a simple faith. So it's just, there's all these variables. You Got know, it. What, what congregation, what devotees did you have in a certain place? What's yeah. the culture of that place? Who are the leaders? And you put all these variables together and you get different results in different places. Yeah. One of the goals I have is to do this kind of analysis and everything you're sharing is super valuable. I really appreciate especially your point about Srila Prabhupada's role being unique as not just a guru but also a founder acharya and how successive generations would only have the guru part of that because he already established yeah. this, this kind yeah, of Yeah, it's, it's not like in it's not like in Prabhupada's teachings there's a little asterisk you know, which means, okay, this is only for the founder of Charya, and if there's no asterisk, it means it's for a bona fide. There's nothing like that. It was yeah. all together. It's a cultural thing that needs to be evolved over time to keep a healthy institution. And you, have, and, exactly. and, and you, have, to, and you have to see what works. Yeah, exactly. You have to see what works, and then, and so now, even now, for example, it's not, it's not like a fundamental principle of bhakti yoga that a guru is not honored with Guru Puja. It's just that in ISKCON, based on certain events, people came to the conclusion that this particular option, which is a detail, that's a distinction that Rupa Goswami makes in chapter six of Nectar Devotion, distinction which has been wonderfully ignored by most of the people who think they're analyzing this. And that is, there are basic principles like Chan Hare Krishna, accept a bona fide guru, worship Krishna. Yes. And then there are details. And so clearly, do you do this, you know, little incense and ghee thing? You know, do you do it only for Prabhupada? Do you do it for your guru? Do you do it for your guru every day, once a week on his birthday? Do you do it in the temple, outside the temple? I mean, those are details. Yeah. Those are not, those are not basic principles of bhakti yoga. The yeah. basic principle is, as Krishna says in the Gita, acharya upasanam, one yeah. should serve the guru. Yeah. And so... Therefore, details by definition of Rupa Goswami and Prabhupada, by definition, they have to be adjusted time and place. So it, it, it's, it's like if you pick up a pair of binoculars and hold them to your eyes, it's not like immediately everything's in focus. You, you've got to move it Adjust back. Adjust everything. Yeah. yeah. So the fact that when Prabhupada left, it took a while to get these details in focus. Welcome to the real world. Yeah. It's and not, so you it shouldn't be surprising to anybody. Yeah, I, I agree. I appreciate that. It, so the analysis is really helpful, and it's you know you're you're shedding light on certain points that I hadn't really fully considered before. In addition to the analysis, I want to try to share certain like episodes or snapshots, stories from different devotees' perspectives to give a sense of what it was like at the time, what people were going through, and. Yeah. So to that end, I wanted to ask you a few follow-up questions from your interview with Kontea Prabhu. If you could share just a little bit more on a couple different moments that, that were kind of significant for how your personal participation in, in ISKCON leadership evolved. The first one you mentioned was when you just came back to New York after the GBC meetings and you were feeling this sense of strong hesitation, re being reluctant to enter into this role because you wanted to be a scholar, you, 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 you wanted to back away from the kind of 
managerial leadership. Um, and then there was a God brother you mentioned who preached to you, you have to do this. So what exactly happened? Who, who was that? What did they say? This was in- That your... was, that, that was uh, my God brother Pragosh. Okay, got it, got it. And what was his argument? What was his case? He said, you gotta do it because there was a vacuum. Prabhupada was gone. People were, you know, the Gaudiya Math was just trying to clean up, you know, doing, you know, doing what they always did best, and that is trying to take advantage of ISKCON. And uh, to give you an example, he came to my, you know, I, this is the way he told me the story. We were, I got back from India in, in 1978 after the Mayapur GBC meeting. So I was a newly minted guru. Yeah. And uh, so we flew back to New York, because in those days you always flew back to New York. And um, we were in the Brooklyn Temple and I walked down the hall to his room and I said, I don't think I'm ready to do this because, because at that time, I actually was sort of burned out. Hmm. You know, just constantly traveling, constantly traveling. And, uh, and, and, you know, problems and, and having, I was in charge of all that in America. How long had you been traveling? How long had you been, when did you first start that? that four role? years, four years. Got it. That's when you first kind of took up that leadership role in, in South America, Latin America. Got it. Yeah. Okay. So that's what you were communicating. So, so, so therefore, I mean, you know, at first it was kind of like, wow, I'm going to be a guru, you know, but then. By the time I got back to New York, I thought, this is not actually what I want to do. Mm. Because I knew I'm not Prabhupada. And, um, and so he preached to me. You see, this, the story, the, uh, the urban legend now is that, you know, we just imposed ourselves on our God brothers. Sure, sure, God. sure. And in some cases that happened. Yeah. I mean, that definitely, in, there were some places, not most of them, where that actually happened. But in my case, I didn't want to do it. And he preached to me. He later became a critic of the gurus at one point in his life. Mm. But at that point, he was telling me, you have to do it. You have to do it. And so then I, um, at that time, I, uh, I was in charge of Latin America, but Balavanta, my godbrother, who, who, had, who had the Southern Zone, at that, at that time, the Southern Zone was uh, Miami, Gainesville, Atlanta, New Orleans, Houston, and um, I think that it wasn't Dallas. Somehow Dallas wasn't part of that zone then. I think Tamal Krishnamaraj had had that had Dallas. I think. No, no, he did. Oh, he didn't at that time. That came later. That came after he first went to Bombay. There was a big fight there and they didn't want them there. So then he asked me if I would, he, so he's going to take over the zone in, in the Midwest. And so he asked me I if see. I would let, let him be the guru in Houston. Got it. Got it. Okay. Got it. Got it. When was that? Uh, that was probably around 79. Got it. Got it. Okay. Yeah. And then you and should. So, yeah, any, anyway, so then. So first, so then, so first to go. So then I called up the leaders in Latin America and I said, you know, I don't think I want to be a guru now. I, I was actually thinking, what the heck am I going to do? I thought maybe I'll take a year off and just chant like, you know, three million rounds a day or something. Yeah. Somehow, you know, you know, lightning will strike and I'll become a guru. Sure. And at that time, because the Gaudiya Moth was attacking, I didn't have the luxury. Yeah. I didn't have the luxury. And, and so, the, so the, my god brothers, Everywhere I turned, my godbrothers yeah. were insisting that I become a guru. And then, so I, I, from New York, I flew down to Houston. I started in Houston and then went to New Orleans, Atlanta, Gainesville, Miami. Yes. So when I got to Houston, the temple president was Lakshmi Narayan. He was about twice as big as me. He was like a really tall guy. Yeah. And so I, I remember we walked into the temple room. It's not like I called ahead and said, hey, I want a throne. Yeah. I walked into the temple room. And uh, there was this little throne, you know, kind of, you know, smaller than Prabhupada's, but a throne, Vyasasana. Yeah. yeah. And I just said, uh, I don't think I'm going to sit there. And then he literally took me by the arm and physically put me on the seat. Yeah. 
of course, of course, the the popular myth is that in all cases, yeah, uh, yeah, the gurus just imposed it, but he put me on the seat. Then the next place I went was New Orleans, where again the temple president was about you know much bigger than me, and so not that he threatened me, but he's a big guy. Yeah, and the same thing, he actually took me by the arm and put me on the seat. So yeah. everywhere I turned, whether it was God Brother in New York, who was a famous book distributor, whether it was the the God Brothers who were leaders in Latin America, whether it's the temple presidents in the U.S. zone, where I was going, everywhere I turned, people were saying, "You have to do this." Yeah. So it was not just like some crazy gurus drunk with power. In my case, yeah. I'm not saying no one was drunk with power. Yeah. But in my case, I was practically forced to do it by my God Brothers. Yeah. And so, and uh, there's another point which is not considered because this issue is generally not thought of in a way that you could honestly call intelligent. Another thing is, as far as the zonal acharya system, Prabhupada had already established a zonal system. For example, I was GBC in Latin America. Yeah. It was unimaginable. It was unimaginable that someone would come to my zone without my permission and just preach there. Yeah. It never happened. This ISKCON functioned in terms of tightly sealed zones. That's the way the whole movement was organized by Prabhupada. Yeah. And, and so, yeah. And so therefore, when I became a guru, it was just another layer of authority. Yeah. It's not. It's not that the idea of autonomous zones where no one interferes in your zone, that didn't begin with the gurus. That was already the way it's con function. Yeah. And so the guru system just was added on to a pre-existing system of authority. Hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. I think that... Uh... Can you still hear me? Okay, got it. It just froze for a second. So you mentioned the Gaudiya Mutt. What was that? What was that like? What was happening? Who, who was who was involved? Well, I mean, they had always been trying to pray. I mean, not everyone, but for it started actually when Prabhupada was here. Yeah. It started when um Pachutananda yeah. had to leave America and went to India because to avoid the draft yeah. in Vietnam. And so Prabhupada sent him a letter of introduction. He stayed with the Gaudiya Math. They tried to recruit him, and they had a plot. They actually had a plot to steal ISKCON. Hmm. Do you it's know all who in the was Lilamrita. doing that? Who was behind that? I heard he went to visit. It's all in the Lilamrita. Yeah. Prabhupada Lilamrita. It's all there. Anyway, so, so that was the first time. And then Prabhupada discovered the plot, and it was a plot, because... Brahmananda, who was in charge of the ISKCON Press, was part of that. And they published a book, uh, Easy Journey to Other Planets, I think it was. And in the new printing, instead of saying His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, they took off His Divine Grace and they took off Prabhupada and they just put A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami. Because the whole strategy was... And this, again, this is in the long, this, this is in the long yes, range. Yeah, I, I remember. The whole point was that the Acharya is Bhakti Siddhanta. Got it. And actually, therefore, Prabhupada is still in the Gaudiya Math, and therefore, all of Prabhupada's assets, disciples, money, belong to the Gaudiya Math. I see. The irony there was there was no Gaudiya Math. There were like you know, 20 different branches, 20 different Got it. And so, therefore, from the very beginning, so then, after Prabhupada left, some of these Gaudiya Math people went into high gear. And also, to be fair, there were certain ISKCON devotees like Jayatirtha, Hansaduda, and others who, when they were disciplined by ISKCON because of their misbehavior, I mean, Jayatirtha was taking LSD, uh, Hansaduda was starting a neo Nazi, uh, basically a neo Nazi you know, called buying military grade weapons, stockpiling weapons. So yeah. it was, um, you know, they had, when you went into the Berkeley temple, into the sort of like the visitor's lounge on the coffee table, they had Mein Kampf, you know, Hitler's book. Hare Krishna. And he was doing other things and he was falling down with women. And so, 
So when the GVC disciplined these people, they decided to get revenge. And so they went, as we used to say, then across the river, another week, to uh, Sridhar Swami. And then they said, okay, you know, Sridhar Swami, he's senior to all these ISKCON gurus. They just basically, you know, they, they used Sridhar Swami to attack ISKCON. Got it. So it became a big mess. And Sridhar Swami, as Prabhupada said clearly in a letter, which is in public domain, uh, Sridhar Swami is one of the main architects of the guru system that destroyed the Gaudiya Math. Hmm. Named Acharya instead of governing body. And then, and Sri Swami in 1978 in Mayapur, when uh, GVC sent a few people to ask Sri Swami for his blessings and advice, because Prabhupada said for technical things, you can consult with him. He basically he urged us to have an Acharya system that, you know, he said the GVC cannot, yeah. uh, cannot order the gurus. In other words, Sri Swami urged us to have the same system that destroyed the Gaudiya Math. So, so when this con, when the GVC had to discipline, another popular myth is that um, that somehow you know that the guru system had more power than the GVC, which is nonsense. Yeah, you mentioned this. You discussed this point with Conte Prabhu, and I thought you made a really yeah. good case about it. That because, because you know in the real world, which sometimes ISKCON is, but in the real world, um, you can have laws. But precisely what the law means and what are the limits of the law, that's tested in judicial procedures. Yes, yeah. And there has to be legal precedence for how you implement it. Yes. And so, yeah. and so the first time this came up for adjudication, what are the relative powers of the GVC? Once I just want to, I'm just working on an essay for this right now for the. Sure, session. sure, sure, sure. Uh, the first was in my actually in, a, in an emergency GBC meeting that took place in my house in the LA area. Yeah. And uh, because, because there were three GBCs were kind of, you know, going off the rails a little bit. These were three of the initial gurus who were going off the rails. Yeah. You mentioned Hamsa Duda and was Nigeria. The third one was Tamal Krishna. Tamal was not breaking any principles, but when he went to Bombay, he was kind of like the poster boy. Now I'm your guru, you know, even my god brothers and god sisters. He kind I of... See. He's, I mean, he actually, I mean, I don't want to, you know, he's a great devotee, did great service. I don't want to criticize him, but he did, he did get heavy in Bombay and basically the Bombay voice kicked him out. I see. That's when he came back to America and took the Mideast. Got it. Midway. So, but I mean, he, he was, he was a faithful ISKCON devotee and he didn't fall down anyway. So it's sort of a different case. Yeah. But yeah. The yeah. The first time, and then of course, the idea was taking LSD on the Vyasasana. And um, and Hansa Duda was doing. So who was at this meeting with you? The G, the whole GBC. Okay, wow! In the in the in your house, they did it was an ad hoc an meeting, like an emergency meeting. Got it. Of the full GBC, which I hosted in my place in the LA area, and um, and there was no question. No one even hinted at the idea. That the acharyas or gurus had power over the GBC. Yeah, no even everyone was. It was clear yeah. this is the GBC's domain of authority to deal with this kind and of. And ultimately, uh, yeah, I mean, it wasn't even it wasn't even a topic. Everyone just took it for granted that the highest authority is the GBC, not the gurus. Yeah. And and it was voted to discipline all three of them in various ways. So therefore, what was the again, outcome? Was was Hamza Duda, did he had he kind of basically left ISKCON by that time? No, no, not at that time. He um he was removed as GBC. I was actually made the ad hoc GBC for Berkeley. Okay. Got it. So that was part of <laughs> Yeah, so I went up there and so I saw what was going on because, you know, I would, yeah. And every day, I would give the Bhagavatam class every day, and every single day I was preaching 
that a, bon a guru was bona fide by following his guru. Uh -huh. Since Prabhupada ordered us to follow the GBC, you cannot be a bona fide guru in this con if you don't follow the GBC. Yeah. I was preaching that every day. Yeah. So, in other words, we weren't that crazy. Yeah. And then, so then with Jayatirtha, what happened Jayatirtha as was, a result of that meeting? Jayatirtha, we did something which was sort of immature, but it was imitating what Prabhupada had often done. And that is, we told him, okay, you have to take sannyas. Because sometimes Prabhupada, yeah, when yep. he did, he say, okay, take like that's what he did with those four devotees that plotted yep. against him. Yeah. He gave them sannyas. And so, so Jayatirtha um, was also falling down with women, actually, at the time. But, um, and then with uh, Tamal, he, his GBC and Guru Zone was sort of greatly Shifted diminished. Shifted and okay, diminished. Got it. Diminished. So he just ended up with Texas, basically. Got it. Before, before he had the whole Midwest, you know, and, and, and he just basically all he had left was Texas. I see. Got it. Okay. One other topic was you mentioned <clears throat> in the interview with Conte Prabhu that your zone was doing really well. Are there any kind of uh, stories, anything you remember prominently to kind of illustrate that, what, what that was like, what that well, period Well, is? the number of devotees practically tripled. Sankirtan went off the charts. Yeah. I mean, by every... Every metric. Company, yeah, it was, it was every, thriving. Every metric. Devotees, books distributed, new temples opened. Hmm. Well, because people, yeah. because people accepted me as really representing Prabhupada, hmm. and so it's so you, it, it was just Prabhupada's potency. But it's like you had that potency now focused locally in different places, hmm. and so yeah, I mean, in terms of making new devotees and farms and and books distributed and and temples open, you know, everything. The movement just really was booming, and then. When the, when the reform movement came and just kind of changed everything, the movement declined, retracted. Mm. Because it was done sort of crudely and without real sensitivity mm. to the fact that there were different situations in different places. Yeah. Yeah, I've noticed that, that when people talk about the history, they lump everything together and make gross generalizations. So that's why I'm trying yeah. to understand more about the individual persons and, yeah 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 you know, it was different it was different in different places yeah so that's why i'm trying to ask specifically ironically so, ironically you get a case like gita nagari <clears throat> where you had a flourishing zone that was ruined by the guru not exerting himself more because the the guru in gbc in that zone which was gita nagari and then i think philadelphia baltimore watching that whole area there Mm -hmm. Nagarin and Mid Atlantic, mm -hmm. including Philadelphia, there was a god brother of ours there named what was his name? Param Brahma. He was the Iskand farm minister. Okay. And Satsarupa's nature was to be, he was very humble and sort of, you know, he's just a very humble guy by nature. Mm -hmm. You know, saintly quality. And so and they had a big guru kula. I used to go there and visit. I mean, they had one of the biggest, best guru kulas in the world. And it was just a big, yeah, it okay. was, there were like there were like probably hundreds of devotees. Right? It was a huge, booming community. Yeah. And what happened is Satsrupa, because of his sort of humble nature, he let this devotee who was a farm minister make all kinds of unjudicious decisions because he wanted just the money for the farm. I see. For protection. So therefore, there was bad management. They had a yogi bar. I mean, what a great name, you know, a yogi bar, like Yogi Bear. And so, which was a very successful business. And he sort of cannibalized, uh -huh. just kept I taking see. the money from it, destroyed the business. And eventually, Gita Nagari just, you know, fell, it just fell apart. And now it's, you know, it's just a tiny, tiny little yeah. out of what it was. Although the people there now are very good devotees. And they, yeah. But, the, the current leaders have done a very good job and sort of solidifying it. But yeah, before it was, there were like hundred. And, and so that's a case where the GBC, where he was a guru in GBC and because he didn't exert himself because he was 
humble, the project ultimately fell apart. So again, the total opposite scenario is what was happening in yeah. other places. Got it. That's very interesting. That's a very good point. That's a good example of that. That makes sense. So then uh, let's see the other topic I'm interested. Well, let's stick with the, the, the uh, at some point, if we have time, I'd like to hear about also your involvement with Srimad Bhagavatam. But before we go there, you said in 1982, you were really one of the main proponents for trying to expand the number of gurus. Could you share yeah, well, more about like, all, that time first period? All, yeah, first of all, every time we did expand, I think the first expansion was maybe a couple of tours. I can't remember exactly what year. I think it was right? 1982, Gopal Krishna Maharaj and Sasrub Dhamadar Maharaj. That's what I was able to research, but it could be wrong. Yeah, I thought it was early, I thought it was 81 or something. But anyway, whenever it was, yeah, every time the number increased, I was the one pushing it inside the, you know, the locked doors of the GVC room. I was I was like the renegade. I still have uh, letters in my files that I wrote to the GVC urging them not to be elitist. We can't have an elitist system. That every Would you share open, those with me? Would you be willing to share those with me? Is that yeah, if you send me, send me an email, I'll try okay. to find them. That, that, that was about 85 or, or no, it was before 85, like 82 maybe. And, and inside the GBC room, I was the one who was like pounding my fist on the desk and insisting that we, we don't want elitism. Every Prabhupada disciple should get an opportunity. And I was considered the troublemaker because I was anti elitist. So who was so, resisting it and what was their rationale? What was the idea? Uh, Bhagavan was resisting. Uh, in fact, he said to me one time, I told him everyone should get the same chance. And and then he actually said to me, he said, he said, tough luck, the world's already taken. Got it, got it. There was a but, mentality uh, of kind of... Uh, I'd say, yeah, Bhagavan, and then sort of, I think Bhavananda was kind of with Bhagavan. There was just a group of them. And I was always saying, every Prabhupada disciple should get the same opportunity to be a guru. So I was pushing that. And, and, and when we did make new people, I was one that was pushing it through the GVC, banging my fist on the table. Even when they changed, officially changed the system in 85 at New Vrindavan, and I joke, you know, you know, for a couple of years in ISKCON, it was easier to become an ISKCON guru than to get a driver's license, you know, because they, they, they kind of went to the opposite extreme. Got it. But um, I was the one that pushed it through the GVC meeting. Got it. Okay. That's helpful. Yeah, I'll, I'll write you an email about those letters. That would be very interesting, very helpful to see. So you mentioned in, then in 85, there was a meeting at New Vrindavan, and this I think is when that kind of reform took place. But you mentioned that this was when ISKCON was the closest it came to splitting. Yeah, 85. What, what, what was what was was that about the guru issue? What, what was it's all about? It's all about the guru issue. Okay, so some devotees were very staunchly opposed. There, to... there was a whole militant, organized political group led by Bahudag. Ravindra Srub started. Ravindra Srub was more of a gentleman, more of a scholar, and he started this campaign like for guru reform. You know, gurus have to be more humble. This, this, and that, and the other thing. He was more of a gentleman. And he was sort of making, you know, he was, you know, just, it's like the power of the pen. He was just making points about we should yeah. work. Yeah. And so, on. so, you know, I, I don't know if I agreed with him on every one of his points, but he was a gentleman. And so with Rabindra, you know, you could, you could talk to him. Yeah. But what happened is his movement, which was called the Guru Reform Movement, was sort of hijacked by some very politically minded devotees led by Bahudak, who was the president of uh, Vancouver. And he just, his, he was born in a political family. Yeah. And, um, he just wanted direct political action. Got he it. was organizing, like, you know, I mean, he was just going about like a political organizer. Got it. And, and, and I, I, and so they sort of had a showdown in New Vrindavan, summer of 85. And as I've always said, that was by far the closest ISKCON ever came to just splitting, breaking I up. I see. 
And uh, so that's why there's an emergency GVC meeting and I pushed through this thing that we've got to change the system. And, um, and so it, it was changed. Got it. There's some, I, I've come across a, a number of documents from that time on kind of what the decisions were and who was there. And, and I, was trying to, I was trying to add sort of a light note too. I was like, because Rabinda wrote an essay and so I sort of wrote a, a reply to it, which we printed. I see. And, I, and so the, I put as a title of my essay, The Empire Strikes Back. Do you still have it? I don't even know if I have it. I mean, I should have kept it, but but at least with Ravindra, it was it was almost like the run up to the American Revolution, sort of like you know you know competing pamphlets, you know, and putting out things. Sure, yeah. But at least Ravindra, you know, Ravindra made points. He wasn't yeah. just you know, wasn't so much politically. He was making he wasn't just points. agitating things. He was trying to approach yeah. these in a very thoughtful way. And, yeah. and so then, and so then, what happened? what kind of blew the steam out of the guru reform movement was that they organized all these temple presidents, Bodak, who was just a, he was just a political pro. He, and so they were gonna go to Mayapur at the GVC meetings with all these temple presidents to demand, you know, this and that. Yeah, like a block. What happened is Bhagavan, who was like definitely on the imperial side of the guru system. Yeah. What Bhagavan did, because he had dozens and dozens of temples in his zone, he brought this huge number of temple presidents and they just, and so they just outvoted. I see. Interesting. People coming from North America. And then, and then Baudak kind of got scourged and he, he left ISKCON, became a meat eater actually. When did he leave ISKCON? Was that after the reform movement succeeded or he didn't see it to its completion? Do you remember? Yeah, when you realize, when you realize that Bhagavan, you know, it's kind of blocked him politically. I see. He got frustrated. Yeah. So, um, anyway, in the meantime, I was just thinking, you know, Prabhupada, we have to say this, Khan, but we have to work this out in a peaceful way. We have to be ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. We have to, you know, just find some kind of compromise. Yeah. So, which is ultimately what happened. Would you say that the, the changes that ended up taking place in terms of how the guru system evolved at that point, was that uh, something like, would you say that th that vision has, has manifested up till today or there's still uh, lacking uh, in yeah, terms you know, of- Common phrase I had back then, and I, I used for years afterwards that ISKCON definitely had a problem. There was definitely a need for surgery. But unfortunately, surgery was done by the village barber with a rusty knife. Got it. In other words, if the gurus weren't so mature, the reform people, they were no more mature. Sure. Probably. Yeah. And so, and, and yeah, the mistakes were made. It was, uh, and then ISKCON entered in this period, it was almost like the French Revolution where they're just hunting down the former aristocrats. So yeah. it, 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 it came to a point where I just had to distance myself from Hare Krishna temples because there was so much negativity. There was so much offense yeah, lumped in with all the other gurus who yeah yeah and, and and so just to save my own spiritual life i had to just distance myself because it just became irrational and uh there were all kinds of rumors about me you know that i had you know i had all these uh, you know clandestine wives or mistresses i had illegitimate children you know I had this i had that just to give you one example of the mood back then I went back to college because Prabhupada had directly ordered me to finish my college education, which I hadn't done. Yeah. So I just kind of. What year did you go back? 91. Okay. I sort of took refuge in that devotional service. Yeah. It was ecstatic. I mean, I loved it. Yeah. I was starving. And so, um, so there was this girl, a student there. I think she was even a graduate student. I was an undergraduate, but I mean, she was a little younger than me. And she, uh, we had a Sanskrit class together. We were the only two people in the Sanskrit class. So, I see. There was a know, teacher and then the two students. Got it. And you were one of the students. So, um, and I, I was much better. You know, I knew Sanskrit because so I already translated the Bhagavatam. Yeah. So, um, and so, you know, we had a nice friendly relation. 
there was nothing, there was no electricity between us at all. She was sure. a pretty girl, just, you know, just, yeah, it was just, it was, you know, just nothing there. And so, um, so then, um, and this girl, by the way, was in charge. She was the director of programs for the religious studies department. Oh, wow. So basically, I could have any program I wanted because, you know, we were friends. So I just told her, okay, I need a room for this. So she would just do anything I wanted. Okay, nice. And she was what nice. You, she was, what university was that? Where did you do your... UCLA. UCLA. Okay, got it, got it. Elite public universities. So, um, so one day she called me up and she asked if she could just drop by because she needed help with some of the Sanskrit stuff. You know, there was no internet. Yet. Yes, yes. No email. Yeah. And, and so I said, sure. So she, you know, she dropped by my place and I just, you know, I explained everything to her. Yeah. And um, at that time, at the time she arrived, there were about like 20 devotees in the room. And Brahmananda and Gargamuni were there. And, uh, you know, with all due respect, they, um, well, to explain to you what happened. So she came into the room. You know, again, it was the room was full of devotees. You were having a program, what you were doing regular, that Our was show. your place? Yes. Sorry, you, you said, I just missed yes. it. Yes, it was my place. Okay, so you were just doing a program? like Darshan, it was just a regular Darshan. Just... Okay, got it, got it. So she came, you know, there was like, it was like, you know, there was like, you know, two seater couch and three seater. So I was in one corner, she was in the other corner. We weren't even sitting on the same couch. Yeah. And I just explained her everything. Yeah. And then she thanked me and she left. And all this took place, you know, around, around 20 people were there. So then Gargamuni and Brahmananda started telling everybody that I had a girlfriend. I see. And they started spreading this rumor. And that's what, but, 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 but that was the, that's what the atmosphere was like. Yeah. I had to tell my disciples not to go to India to the festivals because when they go there, so many people would just feed them poison. Yeah. There was one sannyasi, so called sannyasi named Krishna Balaram, who actually was, you know, grew up in Vrindavan and uh, he's an Indian and he was a uh, serial sexopath. I see. He was just like seducing married women in ISKCON. And so when they had the guru reform and they had the, what I call the gang of 50, you know, he we went to Mayapur and they're going to judge all the gurus. Yeah. So they, and so they interviewed this Krishna Balaram, who was a sexopath who, who of course left ISKCON and became an enemy of ISKCON. Yeah. And, um, and so he was telling them all these crazy stories about me because he had been in Miami, none of which were true. And based on the testimony, and they, you know, they didn't care what I said. So based on the testimony, based on the testimony of this sexopath, yeah, uh, they concluded it was all true. Wow. And then they, and you know, Prabhupada had personally made me a BBT trustee, and I'd always been like the BBT is the holy grail, you know, of this gun. And um, I gave my life for that. And and um, so so because the mood was just to drag down these gurus at any cost. So the, the gang of 50, you know, and, you know, and 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 the uh, and the trustees, they voted that I should be removed from the BBT. I see. On the grounds that I had not made any significant contribution in the last several years. And this was just after I actually finished Prabhupada's Bhagavatam. Yeah. And by the way, all the final translations and all the purports were mine. Originally, they put my name as the author. They changed it and said by a group of devotees because they said if I fell down, they'd have to retranslate it. It was too much trouble. So therefore, even though I actually did the work, they took I my see. name off it. I see. And, and um, um, of course, I mean, Gopi Pranadana was invaluable. He did a great service. Yeah. But ultimately, and the last 10 chapters of the uh, 10th canto, I just let him do it, sort of to, you know, give him credit. But otherwise, all the purports for the the rest of the 10th canto that we did, yeah. all the 
all the final translations and purports the 11th and 12th cantos were mine, but they, I mean, imagine if on Prabhupada's Bhagavatam, you put the editor like Jai Dweda as the co-author. Sure, sure, sure. So, so all these things were going on, you know, they, they, they didn't miss a, a chance to humiliate us. To and yeah. as, far as, as far as what the actual facts were, uh, that didn't matter. Yeah. And so, uh, anyway, so, you know, there are two sides to every story. Yeah. And um, so, so that was the nineties, right? The, the, this 50 committee was. Yeah. So you had done your, you were doing undergrad, you did your undergrad and then you're in school. And you're I was not, actually probably around more like, I can't, 87, 88 around then. Okay. Okay. And then got it. So maybe we could jump back. Did you have a little bit more time? I want to. Uh, no, well, maybe we can talk again because I kind of have to run now. Okay. Yeah. 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 Maybe we could. This is this is kind of a good pausing point, and maybe we could just reschedule something for later. I'd like to hear about how you got involved with the, what basically how the, the from the the perspective of your service to finish the Srimad Bhagavatam, because I, I I've heard that initially Prajumna Prabhu was asked, but then oh the, regarding that 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 that's another urban legend in ISKCON. To, to give you an example, first of all, Pradyumna, who's, you know, I don't want to disrespect him, but Prabhupada was constantly aggravated because he would always procrastinate. I see. Not get things done. He was holding things up. I see. So Prabhupada asked him to finish the translations. In one year, in, the, in a year after, after Prabhupada left, and he, and he knows Sanskrit well, he's a good Sanskrit scholar. Yeah. But in the year, a full year after Prabhupada left, he translated two verses. I see. By comparison, with no purpose, by comparison, when I took it over, I got to the point I was doing 40 to 50 verses per day. Yeah. With wow. purpose. Wow. And so, and so in, this, in, in the end of November of 98, I just knew he's not going to finish it. Wow. And so Krishna inspired me to take up the task. When I decided to do that, um, a few months later, I was traveling through England on my way to Mayapur, and I spoke to him. I invited him and urged him, you know, to work with our team. And this was, and, and what I did was, it wasn't just my idea. It was done under the authority of the BBT. It was done mm. with the blessings of the BBT trustees. Yeah. And... Gopi Pranadana, who was the main Sanskrit editor of the BBT, was going to work on it. So yeah. it was not just my decision. It was a BBT decision that we yeah. do this. Yeah. And I urged Pradyuba to work with us. Let's oh. do it together. He refused. I see. He refused. He didn't want to work with us. But he was invited. Let's work as a team and get it done. And he yeah. refused. Yeah. But... The story that gets out of ISKCON is that, you know, Prabhupada told him to do it, but he was pushed aside. No, it's exactly the opposite. Yeah, no, I, I hadn't heard the pushed aside part from the, <clears throat> in terms of his service on Sri Bhagavatam, but uh, I have, there's the letter that he wrote in 78 about expressing co some concern about the level of, of worship, you know, devotees. Yes, yeah, yeah, that letter. And, and, and he made some good points there. Yeah. However, what kind of, what happened at the GBC meeting, I remember very well, is that he said that um, the guru shouldn't have a big seat, the guru should just have a small seat or whatever. And I just said to him very simply, uh, is that in Shastra? Is there any statement in any Shastra saying that, or is that just a custom for a particular group that Prabhupada told us not to follow? Got it. And he said he was embarrassed because there was no Shastra. Prabhupada had personally told me and the GBC not to associate too much with the Gaudiya Math. I see. We were not supposed to follow them. And in fact, in the Gaudiya Math, they used big seats. That's because they all declared themselves to be Acharyas, yeah. In other words, what Pradyumna was saying, the argument, I mean, his points about we should be more collegial, those were good points. Yeah. Good points. And 
in a sense, I wish I would have appreciated those points more then than I do, you know, than I did at the time. Maybe one of the reasons I didn't appreciate them as much as I should, and this is not really, doesn't really exonerate me, but that is because in other ways he was just, he was saying all these things that just were not too accurate. Yeah. For example, what he was saying is, in the Godi, as I now understand, in the Gaudiya Math, every Gaudiya Math has their own little Acharya. Yeah. And then when other people who are not the Acharya give classes, then they sit on a smaller seat. But that was not completely analogous. Yeah, I mean, you a different it scenario. Was analogous yeah. Because we weren't the Acharyas. Viscon Prabhupada was the founder of Acharya, but at the same time, the people that sat on the smaller seats in Gaudi Ma centers were not gurus. Yeah. So therefore, and it's not in any Shastra. Yeah. It's yeah. just detail. And so therefore, when I questioned him on this and he couldn't provide any Shastric evidence, and there were, and, and so then he kind of, you know, was, he just kind of, you know, he left. But, but the point is, when he said that we should all be nicer to each other, or more collegial, it's not that the GBC, GBC said, no, we shouldn't be collegial. It was just, um, it's because, he, and he didn't, it's not just what he said in the letter. I see. It's the fact that he wanted to change all these things. And um, again, we were going through a process of learning. When I saw all these gurus fall down, I myself realized that, you know, nothing, this isn't really working. Yeah. He didn't, I mean, I mean, there's no way in the world I could have just known that because, first of all, when I became a guru, I was 29 years old. Yeah. 29 years old. I'd been in the movement eight years. And I was just a 29-year-old guy with been in the movement eight years. Hi, Krishna. Yeah. And and there were no previous examples. And Prabhupada never explained how to be a guru who's not the founder of Acharya. He never explained that. He never made that. I mean, he made the distinction philosophically. But in terms of practical application, you know, rituals, ceremonies, not a word, not one word. Yeah. What was the process? Gopi Brannadanapuru, did he do preliminary? Uh, yeah, Gopi Brannadana, when we first started, he knew Sanskrit much better than me. And, and I was just, you know, trying to catch up. And so um, he would do a preliminary translation. And then he would translate for me some of the main commentaries okay. by, you know, Sridhar Swami, Vishwanath, Jeeva, whatever. I would take that material. Of course, in those days, it was all, you know, like typewriters and everything. Yeah, yeah. So, so I would take that material. And first of all, I would do a final translation. You know, I would, because I knew enough Sanskrit yeah. to look what exactly. it said literally. And then, yeah. So I would, I don't, you know, often change it, edit it. Yeah, yeah. Not that he was wrong, I just, because, yeah, you just do it in a way I thought was more, just better. Yeah. It was better. So I would do the final translation. I would look at the commentaries and then I would do the purport. Sometimes I would use the commentary. Sometimes I didn't. Yeah. I was praying to Krishna and I felt Krishna guided me. And so. Following and so through Prabhupada's, he, Prabhupada also did the same. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So I did the final translations and the um, and the purports. We didn't call. I mean, he provided me that. I mean, it was very valuable. Yeah, he made a, a you know very valuable, you know, invaluable contribution. He translated those things, and then so from that, I would, um, you know, I would I would do the purport. Yeah, which were my purports. And then we did that for about a year, I think, a year or two, I can't remember exactly, but, um, and then Gopi moved to India. And once he moved to India, he, I don't know if he lost interest, communication in those days with India was very difficult. And basically I had to do a lot of it myself because I, see. I didn't want to stop. I didn't want to slow down. By that time, I- You know about what year, what year that was approximately? Uh, Or approximately where in the Bhagavad Gita? Approximately 84. Okay, got it. Okay, interesting. 83, 84. Okay, I can and also look. Yeah. yeah, so at that point, so for the last dozens of chapters, dozens, dozens of chapters, I did it by myself. I, I wasn't going to stop. I wasn't going to slow down. 
And I remember Brahmacharya was always just trying to find Gopi in India because in those days it was very hard, you know, trying to get a call through or telegram. And yeah. he was, yeah, you know, he was just kind of interested in other services back then. Got it. And so, yeah, so the second half of the project, I, you know, basically did it by myself. Got it. Okay. Nice. All right. Well, maybe we can stop there and then if, if you're open, we could schedule another call later to talk about more recent, some more recent things. Like I'm interested to hear from you about the inspiration behind Krishna West and the initial challenges you faced with that and what your vision for that was and different things like that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay so why don't you send an email and we'll, we'll fix another day. Okay. Thank you so much, Maharaj. I really appreciate your time. It was great talking to you. Look forward to continue the conversation. Who's your guru, by the way? Vaisheshika Prabhu. Oh, the Vaish. Yeah. Vaisheshika. Yeah, he's a, he's a great devotee. Yeah, he's. I'm very blessed. Yeah, yeah, he's a, as Prabhu would say, perfect gentleman. Okay. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Hare Bol.